Okay, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Steve Hill. Uh, Steve was appointed as Chief Government Geologist and Director of the Geological Survey of South Australia in January 2013. Uh, his role at the Geological Survey is to oversee and coordinate the Geological Survey's research and generation of pre-competitive geoscience data. This includes studies of South Australia's mineral systems, geological mapping and regional geology, geophysics databases and resource prospectivity. Before joining the public service in 2013, Dr Hill spent more than 20 years in academia at the University of Adelaide, University of Canberra and the Australian National University where he was, has worked closely with state geological surveys and over 50 different companies in the minerals exploration industry. He's also been on the executive of the Cooperative Research Centre for Landscape, Environments and Mineral Exploration, the CRC LEAM and the Deep Exploration Technologies Cooperative Research Centre, the DTCRC. Welcome Steve, thanks very much. Okay, thanks for that, Todd. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to share with you some of what we're doing in South Australia. I must preface some of this by saying that it's great to see a lot of familiar faces, a lot of new faces, but a couple of people that we've been working on with, for some of this work, in particular, Yulia at the back here, which I think everyone knows, Yulia, and also Aaron. And so with that sort of technical know-how in the room, what I'm keen to do do today is just share with you a bit about, yeah, broadly what we're doing, but actually a little bit more about why we're doing it. I'm finding that from a geological survey perspective and, and the use of portable XRF, uh, it, it's really important to actually go into it saying, well, what are we really trying to achieve? I think there's been a lot of surveys have a go with, with this sort of technology, um, but, but I want to show you that if you think about why you're doing it, then the outcomes can be really exciting. Okay, so let's have a bit of a look at that. Um, and the examples that I'm going to do are firstly a, a, a drilling, using it in a drilling program, and this is through the Deep Exploration Technologies Cooperative Research Centre. Then the third bit there is about taking it into something really new. And I hope this that third point might sound a bit boring, you know, drill core reference library. Oh my goodness, this this is going to be a good one. But I am certain that this drill core reference library that I'm going to show you will blow your brains. It'll make you think again about sheds of core and what you can do with it and how there are openings for this sort of technology. And then let's get nude at the end. What I'm talking about there is actually something way into the future and that is let's drill a whole continent and look at how we can use this technique there. And I don't actually know the answers to that last bit I barely know the answer to the first few, but I definitely don't know the answer to the last one. And that's, that last point there is something that I really want to sort of stimulate, perhaps either some discussion or further thought. So let's get into it. So let's have a look at what we're trying to do and why we're trying to do it. And look, the essence is that a lot of my state looks like this without the drill rig, okay? And, and perhaps sometimes without the road. So, you know, what are we trying to do? Why, how are we going to tackle those sorts of areas for mineral exploration? The, the thing that's important, and I know I'm getting back to something that everyone knows, but I want to reinforce it because I think a lot of people look at us in geological surveys and think, oh, well, they're just some sort of kooky government people that just do this sort of stuff, and occasionally they give us a bit of funding. But I really want to see us, you know, driving discovery. It's all about discovery. We don't explore for the hell of it. We explore to discover. And, and you know, that's a great, great thing to say. It sounds very profound, but really how do we do it? And from a government perspective, we've got two end members here. We can just let it all happen, you know, and you hear governments say, they're big boys, let, let it all go. You know, we don't pick winners. You know, we can sort of cop out with those sort of things. Or the other end members, we can get involved. We can actually, you know, partner. We can partner with either explorers. We can partner, in this case, with technology developers and, and, and actually try to make a difference. I think the answer is often somewhere in between the two, but I'd like to think that we side a bit more with the, the second one. And, and the reason for it is, you know, all those arguments of royalties and employment, um, but, but also reducing exploration investment risk, developing our pres prospectus for mineral exploration, and because what we want to do is host the best quality and quantity of exploration. Okay, so that's what drives us, and at the end of the day, we can't afford not to do it. You know, drilling is a big part of it. And we have a lot of pressure on us, I think, in a, in a state that's 80% covered, to get involved 
with drilling, particularly in those frontiers that are high risk. This is what's happening. You see this, this, is, a, um, this is a graph that's showing two lines. Back in um, 2003, we, it was pretty similar brownfields, greenfields exploration. But of course, through time, we've had this increase in brownfields, decrease in greenfields. And for a geological survey, we want to see new discoveries stimulated in new areas. We of, often talk about efficiency of mines and so forth. A lot of that's driven by new, high quality, high grade discoveries that best come out of greenfields areas rather than in some cases, trying to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear from um, exploring close to the head frame. I know some people might want to throw a tomato at me now for saying that, but I think there's enough people smiling and nodding that, that I can break even on that comment at best. Um, and that's our challenge. So what we're trying to do here is use how can portable XRF make a difference here? What are you going to do? You know, we, we often look at, you know, analysing rocks. We learn about rocks at university and you get out in your tenement, it looks like this. Well, this is an area not too far away from Olympic Dam, one of the world's largest um, you know, copper, gold, uranium deposits. And that's what it looks like. The mineralisation or the, the target depths in these sort of areas range between 100 metres at best, Olympic Dam's at about 500 metres, um, and you can drill for over 1,000 metres and still not hit basement in these areas. So you know, what, that, that's high cost, high risk. So what can portable XRF do in there? Everyone's starting to recognise this in Australia. We have these big government initiatives. You might hear a bit about, in Australia, things called Uncover. There's a great website there about how governments are trying to get involved in changing that. Um, and, and of course, in South Australia, our investment in these things has made a difference. That blue line there shows the percentage of um, exploration expenditure in South Australia. And since we really got involved in 2004, that's when things changed for us. And so that's the spirit that I actually go into what I'm talking about today. Let's get into it. That's, that's, the, that's the background, a little bit of government sales, but most of it was, I hope, useful background. That's why, that's why we're doing this. So let's have a look at the Mineral Systems Drilling Program. This is a, a, a fantastic world first collaboration between researchers, government, industry, um, service providers, drilling companies, in this case, Port Longyear out there. And what we're trying to do from a technical perspective in the geological survey, that's, this is one of our big objectives, is that there's some really cute cartoons around, but they're complete rubbish. But, you know, no one is drilling or mapping in a way, in South Australia anyway, that is testing this. OK, we can see IOCG mineralisation down, down the bottom there, so you know, things like Olympic Dam. There's a lot of great ideas about how it all connects and leads into other things. You've all seen this sort of diagram for South America and all other parts of the world. But the challenge is, how do we test this in an area that has over 80% of the landscape covered? And what we need to do that is to drill, to drill holes. And we need to drill a lot of them, and we need to drill them cheaply and also quickly. And that's where in that equation, I'm going to show you today that, that portable XRF has a place. The objective from an exploration perspective, of course, is enlarging your targets and also being able to, to work out how to follow up with hole number two, three, four onwards. There's an awful lot of exploration in Australia in these covered areas that is effectively bump or drilling bumps. All right, geophysical survey's been done. We'll put a hole in it. You know, we'll, we'll promise our board that this is, the, this is part of a system, we'll put a hole in it, and it's, it's more missed than hit. Very few things are found with the first hole. So what do you do? You then uh, try and argue that you have to drill hole number two. That may not be that good either. What do you do then? You know, you're starting to test patients. What we're trying to do in the South Australian Geological Survey in working with the Deep Explorations Technologies CRC is enlarge a target like that copper target on your left, which is about a one kilometre by one kilometre area. And we've started to map out the alteration system around it. In this case, that's showing mineralogy, but we are also doing it using geochemistry. And, and a lot of the thresholds we're looking at are appropriate for use with portable XRF. And by doing this, we're enlarging the target. We're now creating a haystack instead of a needle, but we're also creating the, 
the capabilities of being able to vector within that space. You start to get a better feel for a near miss from a far miss. You can start to have an intelligent, informed conversation with perhaps yourself or your colleagues about where to drill next and what you learnt from that hole. So the way we're doing that, as I said, is through collaboration with Deep Exploration Technologies, CRC. And the, and the way they're going about it is to concentrate on three main aspects that they think will make a difference. They call it the three pillars, hence you get that sort of stuff over there on the left. But what they're looking at is top of hole analyses, lab at rig, getting information down hole using probes, autonomous sonde, and then really the, the next frontier that's still being developed, but we're not currently using it out in our programs yet, but we're very keen to use it when it's available, is coil tube drilling. Okay? And what that's, what you might say, oh, but I've heard of that before. What we're looking at here is coil tube drilling for hard rock environments. Okay? Lightweight, lightweight rig, um, something that's quite portable, easy to move around, and the sort of aim that they have in DTCRC is to, is to radically reduce drilling costs, but also radically reduce the time it takes to make decisions. Okay, I'll, I'll get onto this later, but they're talking about using Labbit rig analyses to give real-time results that are coming out and being moved on faster than the core is coming up out of the hole. Okay. Just a bit of a Thank you to, to the sponsors of, of, of all of this research. I think just most of them have had a, bit of, a fair bit of skin in the game. Some of them a lot of skin in the game, but a fair bit. Uh, and then also onto some of the affiliates of the project as well. In order to set this up, it's not just a matter of going out in the bush and drilling holes and hoping that it all works. We've also put a lot of effort in South Australia in, in trying to set up a drilling research training facility. And it's at this facility, which is an old pyrite mine, um, that we've been testing a lot of the technologies, including the Labbit rig technology. So using portable XRF in that Labbit rig setup. Okay, so it's a disused mine. Uh, it's not that far out of Adelaide. It's only about a um, 45 minutes drive, maybe half an hour if Yuli is driving, um, to get up there and be able to have a look at all this, all this uh, equipment at work. As that's being tested, you need to get it out of the test conditions and out into the field. And that's what we've been driving at with this drilling program in South Australia. And to do that, we've set up a collaborative program with DTCRC, but also with industry, researchers and service providers. And to the best of my knowledge, this is a world first of getting those different groups together at the same time. We're collaborating the two companies, Kingston Resources and Minotaur. Actually, I'll stop pointing with the aerial and use this. Um, and, and what we're trying to do, you can see this Gawler Range Volcanics. They're the 15, 90 million year old volcanics that are, the, are basically the same age as Olympic Dam. So we're looking here at part of a crustal section from that Olympic Dam aged event. And so the drilling we're doing is trying to inform us relative to that cartoon that I showed you earlier in the talk. This side in particular seems to be more prospective for iron oxide copper gold mineralization. Out here, it's a bit of a frontier, but there's a lot more well, it's felt to be a lot more potential for epithermal type systems or shallower crustal levels. I just want to just to highlight wh why collaboration is beneficial in this, is that a $2 million input from the government has now been leveraged to more than a $7 million program for this. Okay, so this is a little bit out of date. I think we've now drilled uh, 10 holes and we're drilling in the west now, so this is, this is a bit behind. Um, but it's certainly up and going. It started in July, it should be finished by April. Um, and it's not just about testing that cartoon and doing the drilling, it's, it's drawing through these technologies. So Labbit rig, different other parts of you know, downhole probes and so forth. I think the, um, I see Mike's down in there from Bort Longyear, is it? No, that, that there's potential for Bort Longyear to be, um, or they currently um, have commercialised some of this. Um, we're also trying other research techniques off this, so um, seismic and, and so forth. And what we're trying to solve here is that problem of drilling, sample, measure, interp and target. But to do it in a time frame that the drill rig is still out there. So not getting your core, cutting it, sending it off to the labs, 
waiting a month or so to get your analyses back. We want to be making decisions in real time or at least while the drill rig's out there. And these are some of the results that we're getting from the Labbit rig. I'm not going to pour too much into the technical layout of the Labbit rig. There are some IP sensitivities there. And I, don't, I think as a director of a geological survey, it's probably a bit beyond my mandate to, to start playing around with other people's IP in a presentation. But um, here we can see it um, in through here. Uh, it's connected to the solids recovery unit, which is in through there as well, that's connected to drilling. But this is the bit I just wanted to, to start off with um, tantalising you about. Here we see a log that's been performed by uh, a geologist on site. Has to wait for the core to come up. You know, then look over it, you know, over the next day or something like that. But here we can see the results that are coming through in that drilling, as I said, faster than the core is coming through to the surface. And you can see range of elements through here, I don't unpack that too much, but picking out a lot of these major lithological breaks. The point of that is it's informing the logging, but it's also informing the decisions that are made on the drill rig in that time frame. Just a little bit more about the Labbit rig. Here it is as a trailer mounted setup, um, the different parts on that trailer, but it does offer that flexibility also of other ways of, of, of mounting the unit. Some of the other things that, that concern people, what it's actually looking at are the, are the rock powders that are coming from the drilling, that are coming up um, through the drills, through the annulus of the drill. And from that material that's often discarded, we're actually getting pretty good depth resolution. Here we can see a geological break at 964 metres, reflected in this chemical change at around about, it's about plus or minus a metre over 960 metres depth. So the depth resolution that's coming through on this is absolutely outstanding. The, the results that they're getting are actually so sensitive and so informative, you then have to start worrying about artefacts in the results. And in this case, you've got these big kicks for for tungsten, moly, copper, iron and chromium that are actually related to drill bit wear rather than real geology. This is going to start changing things because we're going to have to start knowing a lot more about the compositions of our drill bits and equipment and perhaps even looking to design things that are not offering that same amount of contamination. What we're also getting though, speaking of artefacts, in this case are these kicks in zinc which got everyone quite excited for a while there, but was later found to be relating to the grease that was used at rod changes. This is actually a real warning to everyone because what was happening was the geologists that were on site were looking at these results and then using them to inform their logging of the core and they were logging lots of sphalerite. <laughs> right? there, were, there, were, there were bits of sulphide in the drilling. But, so I guess a word of warning there, be careful. Think about what you're doing. You've still got to be a geologist. And then, once again, through um, Reflex and, and, and their hub, being able to do near real-time rock discrimination. All this is available online. A lot of the data, we're having a bit of a lag because we need to allow the companies an ASX, a, a, a stock exchange opportunity to, um, to release to shareholders and so forth. But um, a lot of the other updates are happening up there pretty quickly. So please... Get on board, have a look at this, keep updated with it. Over the next year, there'll be a whole lot of follow-on research. We're going to be doing um, you know, traditional geochemistry on the holes and traditional mineralogy. We also are very close to finalising an agreement with Mineralize. I think Axel spoke earlier, didn't you, Axel? Is that still, coming. still coming. Okay, no worries. Um, and they're looking. We're looking to work with them on analysing the same drill hole material that we've analysed here. So that's using their XRF technologies for, for drill core logging. Okay, so that's one of the things we're doing. I know I've sort of given you a bit of a taste or a bit of a run through it. As I said, please talk to people like Yulia and Aaron for a lot more of the technical details. They're a lot more connected to the IP sensitivities there as well. Sorry for shirking that one a bit to you guys, but it's true. Um, I now want to talk to you about something a little different, somewhere that we want to take a lot of that. So that whole philosophy of that real-time, non-destructive analyses that we're seeing happening in the drill rig, what, what can we do to drill core libraries, which some people think are a bit boring? Well, what we're doing in South Australia is we're setting up this $32 million drill core library. 
This is the architecture plan of it. Well, this is what it looks like to an architect. But this is what it looked like in January. This is what it looked like in October. And this is what it looked like a couple of weeks ago. It's now been completed on budget, on time. And this is definitely more than just a core shed. What we have in South Australia is 7.5 million metres of drill core. This facility will give us a further 20 years capacity. So there's a lot of core in there. But what, what is also exciting is what's connected to that storage of drill core. In this particular case, we have an analytical wing that's connected to it. But here we can see the high logger, the hyperspectral scanner that's scanning the drill core you know, in the library. But we're also, as I said, looking to um, finalise an agreement with Minalize to have their XRF analyzer in the same wing of this building. And the ambition here is to provide people that come to the core library with the ability to get near to real time non-destructive analyses. I'm not, I don't want to see a, you know, a sort of conventional laboratory built here. There's plenty of service providers that do that. What we really want to see is the potential for people who visit the core library to be able to come away from that visit that day or next day uh, with some answers bit, that, that take them beyond just a visual inspection of the core. So they're the sort of opportunities that are available. And then also with all of that data that's being produced, being able to view it, in this case in an in a immersive 3D laboratory, so backlit facility here, we can see Olympic dam holes with uh, uranium and copper geochemistry pre uh, presented on it. And essentially follow this vision, which was first I first saw presented by James Cleverly back a couple of years ago, where we're starting to take core libraries beyond, as I said, just looking at trays of drill core. And I think portable XRF, portable XRD, the sort of things that we're talking about today, have a fantastic opportunity in this sort of space. Just to wrap it up, I've got one last thing that I just wanted to try and um, get you also thinking about, and particularly thinking about how can portable techniques be used in this, is if we can get that drilling as cheap as DET looked to be getting it, so around about that less than $50 a metre cost, then all of a sudden for geological surveys, that the viability of doing large drilling campaigns, in this case through the Eastern Gawla, actually become quite viable. So this sort of array through here, and I'm not suggesting pattern drilling, I'm just done this just to model it out. This sort of array would cost, and, and the blue holes are ones that are already drilled, so the, the infill through there, would actually cost $6.5 million on that scheme. That's not beyond a reasonable uh, government input. It's, if you then take that back to the work that we've done on mineral system footprints, where we're looking at you know, 10 kilometre mineral system haystacks that we're targeting, then this sort of drilling would be pretty effective in being able to at least hit and give you some information on those mineral systems haystacks. And these sorts of things, I think, are, are fast coming upon us as a, as a real option to change pre-competitive data in geological surveys. That's where NUDE comes from, National Uncover Drilling Endeavour. But I think they're actually going to go with something like National Drilling Initiative. <laughs> Politicians and governments being what they are. Um, so, you know, it, it is the effective way to truly map 80% of the covered geology. The advantage is it retrieves a sample from these areas and it provides that information to add confidence to the geophysical models, which in many cases, as I said, are leading explorers towards drilling bumps, but then not knowing how to do the follow-up. A bit of ins inspiration from geophysicists, physicists, they're not all bad. They already have a program going in Australia for 50 kilometre grid spacing of magneto telluric's data collection. So if they can do that, why can't we start doing the same with drilling and then looking to use the sort of lab at rig and other techniques? Some of the, quest of some of the great things is cheaper, faster drilling is going to be needed. Land access for this will be a challenge. Funding the program, preparing it, getting people that can still run those sorts of equipment and technology, um, how would just target the sites, what sort of spacing will be important. And then 
that combination of traditional drilling for stratigraphic purposes alongside, say, coil tube drilling with elaborate rig set up with it. And also, what sort of value add other analytics to go with the drilling. Hopefully that's given you a bit of a taste for where things are at with what we're trying to do in the South Australian survey. I've talked to them about regional drilling programs, bringing that sort of new technology into the core library, and then perhaps getting out and covering all of a continent with drilling and that sort of technology as well. That's, that's pretty much it for me, guys. Or maybe a question for, for, for Aaron, actually. Yeah, no, that's great. So the, the, the analysis, uh, the lab at rig analysis, the PXRF, so that is coming off of the sludge that's getting returned in the water. Now, like, how is the sample prepped? I guess. The funny thing is, for so many years we've gone back to my, so many years we've been throwing away the best sample, is that the drill bit's actually producing a very fine powder that's about 80% less than 40 micron. And there's actually a paper that um, Julia and I are publishing that's just about to come out fairly soon, all about this. Um, and actually it's double the volume because the, uh, the drill bit's bigger than the drill core and we don't cut it in half. So the sampling statistics, the sample quality are a lot better. So we essentially dry that material. It's got uh, extremely good homogeneity and representativity. And even better than that, very good depth fidelity, better than sort of 10 centimetres at uh, a lot of the studies that we've done. So it's an extremely good sample. Just collected, dried. It's uh, yeah, lab at rig is a whole system. We collect the sample, we dry it, we put it in the, in the, the very best sample presentation. I'll actually talk about it in my talk um, to as much as I can. Obviously, as Steve mentioned, there's a bit of IP sensitivity, but lab at rig now exists. It's a commercial product. You can go to Reflex and talk to them about deploying it to your... Uh, to your site. Um, the fully automated one isn't quite here, but there's plenty of middle product that's ready to go. So, but we'll talk about it uh, more in the last session. <laughs>